All right, welcome back to Resilient Voices and Beyond. I believe this is episode 11 or 10. Don't quote me. I'm going to figure it out before the end of this episode um, and tell y'all. But this is either episode 11 or 10 of season two. It has been a long time coming. Season one, 51 episode, three episode collab with the National Foster uh, Youth Institute. Now we're on season two and we are 10 or 11 episodes in. <laughs> episodes in. And um, I'm so excited. Um, I've talked to many, many people from foster youth to foster parents to adoptive parents to case workers to people working with legislation and so forth. And they all have said how insightful this is. And um, I just wanna throw it back to those individuals. You guys inspired me to create this platform to be able to showcase the real, the truth, the authentic um, truth and just talk about it. Really just talk about it in hopes that by through experience and expertise, we can help educate, you know, and reverse the narratives, you know, challenge those stigmas and promote reform and promote change um, for an ever evolving system um, that affects us all. So y'all know I can talk. Without further ado, I'm gonna have my guest introduce himself because y'all know I can go on, but go ahead. Hello everybody. Um, my name is Cortez Carey. Uh, <laughs> I feel so good about being on this podcast, um, to share with you guys, um, a little bit about my journey, um, and about, you know, who I am. This is my very, very first podcast. So I'm on it, um, to share this space with you. Um, and I'm, I'm ready. Awesome. Awesome. It's such a privilege, such a privilege to be able to have you on. I know you're a very important man. You yeah. know? <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <laughs> and um, just, you know, as we get ready to get to know you a little bit better, better, um, we're going to see that. Um, so my first question is really just diving deep into the beginning of your experience to whatever level you would like to share. You know, um, if you don't mind walking us through what led to your experience in care and what have you? Yeah. Um, so I feel like I've spent a, a quite a bit of amount of time uh, learning how to strategically share my story. And yet every time I never know where to begin. <laughs> but I will begin um, back to where I know. Um, I have been in care my entire life. Um, and I've actually gone through, or I was in care from birth to 21. So I was in foster care. I experienced kinship um, care. I was even adopted. My adoption was um, dissolved. Um, and I've been in shelters, host homes, group homes, uh, juvenile delinquent center. So I've experienced every realm of the system, um, which some would say make you like an expert really. Um, but I have to be honest, some of those areas I was maybe placed for 30 to 60 days. Yeah. So I was adopted for a, a quite a bit of, uh, of time. Um, think four or five years um and I experienced like kinship care throughout my time before and after my adoption yeah and I also um you know took advantage of you know some opportunities and uh aged out of the system at 21. Okay yeah so if you don't mind you know yeah. I'm gonna dive a little bit more deeper okay um because you 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 gave me a lot there you gave me a, a lot of nuggets I okay. like to follow <laughs> Um, and, um, much like myself, we kind of share that similar, you know, um, it wasn't kinship for me. It was more so guardianship. Okay. Um, but it was unofficial kinships. I have experienced, um, not through the system, but bouncing around before I was in the system. Um, so give me this, this, you know, um, to your earliest memory, um, mm -hmm. You said you went into foster care first, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, what was that experience like in your head? What were some of those thought processes for you, you know, um, throughout that, whichever happened to, you know, um, make that transition possible? Yeah. So I didn't learn of, you know, my experience within the foster care system and how it happened until I was probably 14 when I was able to ask yeah. questions and get answers. Um, they weren't all accurate at first. Um, so it took me some time to like meet a caseworker that I actually trusted and she actually let me read um, some files. So shout out to her. She's still in my life to this day. But I'm gonna take you back to um, me at four years old because I, 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 I don't remember anything before then. I remember almost everything after. Um, but I was four years old. I was with one of my biological brothers. Um, my mom has six children. I am the fifth of six. Um, and my father has a few and I'm the second to last on that side as well. Um, but I was with one of my mother's children, my brother, my big brother is the one who is the step above me. We were in the mall with our uh, foster mom at the time who ended up adopting us later on. And we were getting our uh, pictures drawn, like the character, character, caricature pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we were getting those drawn. Um, and, you know, my life as it was in foster care and then right into adoption, for me, it was pretty normal. But my normalcy looks way different than yours or anyone else's. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until later that I learned that it was tumultuous <laughs> and, um, you know, unhealthy uh, the way we were being treated and living. Um, but I didn't see it as anything other than normal because that's all I knew. Um, it wasn't until I was six years old when I met my baby brother, um, who's like my favorite person in the world. Um, he came to live with us. We were adopted at that time. He came to live with us. Um, and I just remember being so excited waiting at the door to see what he looked like. And to my surprise, he looked just like me. <laughs> um, and yeah, so uh, I, I don't know if I'm rambling right now, but uh, that's the beginning of it for me. Um, okay. it, was, it, was, it seemed to be just normal. Um, and I guess later on I can get into, you know, why I thought it wasn't normal after a while. Right, right. So um, early as experience is four. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time you were already placed in what was it, a, an adoptive home? No. So we were we were in foster care at the time. I don't okay. believe I was adopted until later maybe five or six. I do know that when my baby brother came to live with us, we were adopted already because he went okay. through his own adoption at that, uh, from that uh, guardian that we had, that we shared. Okay. Okay. So my brother who is, is uh, you know, stair step above me, we were adopted at the same time by this, this woman. And um, then my brother, my baby brother was adopted by the same woman a few years later. Okay. I'm just building this timeline. Yeah. I'm building this timeline. Okay. Um, so from four, let's, let's, let's go to range from four to 14. Okay. Um, what, how, like, what were the placements you experienced? Um, and um, what were some of the barriers and obstacles whether it was um, abuse, neglect, or um, whatever led, led to a displacement throughout that age range from four to 14. Okay, um, four to 14. So we were in uh, the home where we were once adopted. The adoption was dissolved when I turned 11 um, for various reasons, um, but there was, um, yeah, various reasons, and we were all removed from the house at different times, all okay. three of us, three different times. Uh, I was removed in September of 2000, and 
two. Um, and then my brother was removed. My baby brother was removed in Christmas Eve, 2002. And then my brother, who was the you know stair step above me, was removed the following year, 2003, I think springtime. So um, after leaving there for me, uh, I went to a shelter for 30 days, um, then was moved to a group home where I spent a year. Um, and my baby brother followed thereafter once he was removed from the home. Um, after that, after the year I spent, I started, um, they were getting ready to place me on like the big boy unit. And I was only 12 at the time. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm not going there. It was everybody was 15 to 18. And because I didn't have like a permanency plan, um, that was my plan. Um, that's the plan that they had, you know, in store for me. So I kept asking, like, is there anybody that I can go live with? Um, and they asked me about, you know, my biological family. I said, I only know where one of my biological aunts live, um, which, you know, I've later found out it was a, a bridge away from where I was living when I was adopted. Had no idea. Um, but so I went to go live in kinship care. I ran away after a year and a half from my biological aunt's home. Um, and... I ran away to my biological grandmother's house, which was the neighborhood, you know, uh, next to it. After living there for about two to three months, um, myself, my baby brother, and my brother, who's a stair step above me, came to live there as well. And the system, you know, agreed to give her resources. After, I think, two to three months, um, we were uh, removed from her home because of lack of um, space. So she only had a two bedroom duplex. It was three of us boys. And I guess there was not enough space in the one bedroom to house all three of us. So instead of giving her, you know, some housing resources, because she was equipped to care for us, and it was biological family, um, they removed us and they placed us into a foster home. Um, the foster home we stayed in, I think I was about, I was in ninth grade when we moved there and they allowed us to continue to go to our school and we finished the school year there. And then the very next school year, we started in the neighborhood that I, we were you know, residing in at the time in our foster home. Um, it was a horrible school, horrible school, but uh, we, myself and my baby brother were removed. Um, you know, we got a breaking and entering charge. Basically, we were given, you know, rules for the house. And looking back at it, I always say, um, by the way, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's where, that's where I lived. But um, I always say this was the only foster home I, I lived in where the foster parents, she, all she wanted to do was care for us. The only one. All the other ones, there were, you know, stipulations. And if they weren't getting this, then we couldn't stay. But this woman genuinely cared for us. Um, but at that time, it was too late for me. In my mind, I'm doing what I wanted to do. So she asked us not to stay out late. I stayed out late. She asked us plenty of times to come in at the, you know, correct time and she locked the door on us so we kicked down the door um we were then you know the police were called and we were removed from our home and placed in the shelter we were in a shelter for about it was only supposed to be a 60-day shelter we were in there for a few months more than 60 and this was the first time I experienced and I think I'm 14 at this time by the way um and this was the first time I experienced interviews we had parent foster uh, potential foster parents come and visit us in the shelter, and we got to choose who we wanted to live with. I had never experienced that. Uh, I didn't even know that was an option. Um, so, of course, my myself and my baby brother, we chose someone who lived nearby our biological family um, so we can stay in touch and who lived in a school district um, that our biological family attended as well. Um, 
And this was the first home I had ever lived in where a man was head of household. I've only ever lived with women until this time. I think I, I think I might have been turned. I've been fi- I was fifteen then. Yeah. So then okay. that's forty. That's forty fifteen. So that was a host home that ended up turning into a permanent foster home for me. Okay. So I'm gonna just unpack because okay. you gave me a lot there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I can talk, um, man. I can talk. And I'm taking notes. You know, experience in the shelter. Mm-hmm. So. I can't even begin to speak, but what was your experience in the shelter? Did you feel like you got resources? Did you feel like this was like this? I, I don't know, you know, but um, what was your um, detailed experience? Like, was it good or bad? Did you feel supported? Did you feel like you needed what you had? But those first initial 30 days, you stayed there. Okay, let me think back. All right, so when I got into, when we were placed in the shelter, um, the first the first thing that felt familiar for me, the first sense of familiar, familiarity uh, was um, a youth who was placed there as well. We were in the first group home I had ever been in together. So as soon as I saw him, it was like, oh, that's family. You know, um, if you've ever been put in that type of situation, you know, you gravitate, you know, us youth, we gravitate towards what we we know. And I knew him. Mm-hmm. Um, and then not only was he placed there, but my favorite staff from the first group home I had been placed in was a staff member there. So that was my boy. That was my dog, you know. So I felt at home. I'm not even going to lie to you. I felt at home. Um, I didn't have much trouble, um, other than I had like an issue with a staff member who I got into like a physical altercation with, um, due to like outside, um, activities. I didn't really get along with his little brother who was my age. We had, you know, physically fought and everything. And, you know, he's trying, I felt like he was trying to, you know, Um, take advantage of his position um, and, you know, manipulate uh, me, you know, as a, as a, a a youth in the, in the, in the shelter. Um, So other than that, though, I felt at home. It was, you know, I didn't have any trouble. I got along with all the boys on the unit. My baby brother was on the same unit as me in the shelter. So I was, we were good. The only thing that I was not okay with was the school system. Um, We went to, um, I believe it's called an AIU, um, you know, through an AIU uh, program. And I felt I was so bored, man. Um, I wasn't learning anything. Uh, It was like three teachers, you know, teaching six different subjects. Um, So, yeah. Other than that, though, I, I was okay, And I wasn't there long. It wasn't long before we started the interview process with the potential foster parents. Okay. And the temporary, the the temporary shelter is in one and the same with the group home. No, it was, it was, it was different, but one of the youth who I was in the group home with was in that place, in that shelter once I got there. And then one of the staff members from that same group home was a staff member at the shelter. Okay. Yeah. So this was, Four years apart. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm going to ask this question a lot throughout okay. this, you know, but um, mental, mental wise, mm-hmm. you know, mentality, um, you, you spoke how, you know, it was easy. It didn't really, did you find it easy to assimilate to institutional or residential life, you know, versus being out in the community? Yes. So um, I had gotten used to that. I, w- I told you I was in the group home when I was 11 for a year. Uh-huh. I had gotten used to it very fast. I have always been able to adapt to my surroundings. So that wasn't an issue. And to be honest with you, 
I didn't, I wasn't like getting bullied there. I didn't have any issues like that. So okay. as long as I was able to be with my little brother, I was good. And that's all I ever asked for um, following our separation from the home that I was adopted in. So whenever, whenever I was able to go to my biological mother's house, he came shortly after, or biological aunt, I'm sorry. He came shortly after um, my grandmother's house. He came shortly after uh, the foster home we were placed in. He came, I think we went there together. And then the shelter, we were there together. So as long as I was able to be with him, I was good. Okay. Yeah. So far as your, your, your mental health throughout that four to 14, Mm-hmm. You know, um, but also because there was a person you really didn't know until like 14 yeah. about what all was going on. So 14, you finally find out all what's going on. Mm-hmm. What does your mental, you know, how, how do you take that in? I was a very inquisitive child. Um, I wanted to know everything. Uh, I wanted to be at every court hearing, even if I couldn't say anything. I wanted to hear everything that was going on. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to know why me and my baby brother looked just alike, but my brother, who's a stair step above me, we didn't have any of the same features. Um, you know, I, 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 there, I wanted to know everything. So I think that's when, you know, I started to, without even knowing uh, subconsciously, you know, feel like, okay, this, this bothers me to a certain extent. And I have to get to the bottom of why. Um, And I still wasn't like aware of like my mental health state. But for sure, I wanted to know why about everything. Yeah. Um, I wasn't even acknowledging my mental health state at that time. It, it still was an enigma. Was no, it. yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Um, so now I want to transition. Fifteen to eighteen. Okay. Um, what was that journey? You started with um potential interviews for foster parents, mm-hmm. then going to stay with them, mm-hmm. um, and then that becoming a p- permanent foster home for a period of time um take us take us from there okay I'll try to be I'll try to be brief because I could talk man (laughs) um 15 in the shelter with my little brother we were interviewing foster parents I let him choose I said wherever you feel comfortable living I'm cool um and we were a pair there was no splitting us up um so We had a few people come, a white couple came, um, and I'm, I identify as Black or African American, and I was not down for that. I just, which was so crazy and ironic, because when I was younger, when I first moved out of the home um, that I was adopted in, I, I used to beg, plead, and pray for a white family to take me in, because the people I went to school with you know, were mostly white and they had packed lunches. They had snack money, you know, always had clean shoes. And so I was like, yeah, I got to live with a white parent. I have to, right? Um, but I don't know. There was something that told me at 15, like, nah, they, they, that's not the route to go. So then we had a single black man come in. And immediately I was like, nah, I just, I already knew I, I had already become in my head, the person I thought I was going to be as an adult. So I'm like, yeah, nah, I don't want that. I don't want that to be challenged. But my brother fell in love with this guy, man, because he, you know, painted this picture, you know, he has children. He has a son, my brother's age, biological son that lives with him, who is, very much so in the sports. My baby brother was super in the sports. You know, um, this guy, you know, goes to all his son's games. And so basically he won us over (laughs) and he won my little brother over. So I just chose to go with him. Um, Moved in there. I turned 16 shortly after. It was, everything was all good at first. I think we did like a couple home visits. 
um, before we actually moved in, everything was straight. Um, it wasn't until I got a job. Um, he helped me get the job, everything. He told me, hey, man, I know you're only applying to Taco Bell, but you need to go down there in a shirt and tie. And I said, okay, right down the street. Went down there in a shirt and tie. Um, just like you said, I mean, they didn't even have any positions open, but they offered me a job because of the way I presented. Um, and that stuck with me. I will say that. That stuck with me and still sticks with me today. Um, so I was working nonstop. I think I worked like, you know, as much as I could as um, someone under 18 and in high school. It got to the point where I was skipping school to work once I got a manager that, you know, was kind of cool. Um, and I didn't want to go to school anymore. Um, I was getting money. I was, you know, being able to, to finally buy the like clothing, the sneakers that I wanted, all that. Um, and we started butting heads um, because I would really disregard his, you know, the rules and regulations of the home. Um, and I felt like I had enough say because he wasn't buying me any clothing. He wasn't really buying me any food that I wanted to eat. I was doing all that for myself. Plus, I was doing it for my little brother alone. Uh, you know, even though there were other kids in the house and, you know, he had to do for them. I didn't even need that at that point. At least I thought I didn't. So around the age of 17, I got in trouble for not going to school. Um, and, you know, I guess there was like a watch on me, whatever. School was really tough for me at that time because I just felt like I couldn't relate to other people. You know, I was, you know, I've always been an independent person, but I was also like, I felt like I was more, a, you know, my mentality was more adult-like than, the, you know, the youth around me, the kids around me. So I just didn't feel like I related to many people. Um, it got to a point where, you know, I had turned 18 or I was approaching 18 and my caseworker was like, Hey, what do you want to do? What's next? And I told her, I, I'm good. I'm, you know, I'm a graduate and, you know, I'll, I'll just continue to work. You know, this was like the fall before I turned 18. I've turned 18 in the spring. And so she was like, well, you do know in the state of Pennsylvania, the laws, remain that you can not live in a host home or foster home and after the age of 18 while your host parent or foster parent continues to get resources unless you are enrolled in an educational institute or you have some sort of medical um, issues I didn't have either one of those I did not plan to go to college anything so I'm like oh I don't know what I'm gonna do um, so she told me to look into CCAC, which is a community college of Allegheny County. Didn't look into it, didn't care. College was not my thing. As long as I could make enough money to buy food and buy sneakers, I was cool. It wasn't until I got expelled from school my senior year, like probably months after that, um, where I was like, all right, stuff has hit the fan. Um, I was out of school for maybe two months searching for like a school to enroll in um, because I got expelled for fighting. Um, but it wasn't just like the one fight. It was like, I had been causing problems, trouble in this school district for years now. They were over my stuff, man. <laughs> um, and so I finally found an alternative school. Shout out to my cousin's mom who, you know, found a school for me, um, enrolled in that school. The school was a joke. I lied to you not. I, that was the fall of 2008. I stopped going December 2008, came back May 2009, walked across the stage. You know, um, And so that's when the conversation became more serious about my next moves. I just enrolled into community college. I knew I didn't want to be homeless. I didn't have anywhere to go. Um, so my foster parent allowed me to stay there because he was getting you know, paid. It got so bad, I didn't even care any longer. Um, I told my caseworker I needed to go. Um, we weren't getting along. I was afraid it was going to turn physical. Um, I really wasn't like liking how, you know, things were going in the home as far as like everybody else living there and my little brother and myself. I just didn't think things were fair. 
Um, so I, I said, it's time for me to go, man. Not knowing what, you know, the world was going to be like. So I was uh, fortunate enough to get into a uh, independent living program that allowed me to live by myself at my own apartment in the city and uh, only pay 30% of my income. It didn't matter if I worked 10 hours a week at McDonald's. I only had to pay 30% of my income. Um, that really helped me, you know, grow up a lot. Um, that was the first time I had to pay any bills outside of my phone bill. And of course, like, you know, just buying sneakers and clothes and food for myself. That was the first time. So um, I enjoyed it. I really did. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm supposed to start stop at 18, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's about it then. That's about it at 18. Okay. At 18, that's going to happen. So, yeah. 15 to 18, you, uh, I, and I'm pretty sure it was a little bit more before that. 15, 18, you tired of everybody telling you what to do at this point. <laughs> you know, all right, you, 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 you know um, you've had some failed inconsistencies with people in your life, and um, you've had some people who showed up, but at that point, in, in that point in your mentality, it's too late, you know, and right. I'm going to do me. And, right. um, a lot of alumni, a lot of foster youth and care, you know, been there, done that. You know, I can speak for myself, you know, after so many inconsistencies with people trying to show up and be a parent, trying to be, play dad, play mom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that role was tarnished for me. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I need to take care of me. Yeah, it's over with now. to the finish line. Like, yeah. and I ain't know what that finish line is like. But it get me to the finish line. Because can't nobody ain't they they don't know what they're doing. You yeah. know? <laughs> it's over with. I've already developed into the person mm -hmm. that I think I'm going to be as an adult. I'm good. Right. Yeah. Right. And um, I like I was talking with someone else. We were having the same conversation about like parentified youth, but in the aspect of when you go through so much as a young kid, you grow up, you know, and within growing up outside of the main adult things you've right. had to make adult decisions so how do you go back to be a kid right and step into that kid play like okay yeah you're right you know maybe you know better when you've had to be that adult for your own life mm -hmm. um and, and i wasn't i felt like i wasn't only looking out for me i was also looking out for my little brother mm -hmm. so that's you know double trouble right there and i, I was just fed up you know Definitely, definitely. Um, I, I can relate to that. You um, you talked about having experience, you know, um, try and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, trying to find really identity and purpose and for your future, you know, yeah. throughout that transition, like really, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> You know, whatever gift is met, you know, um, yeah. and I can get that. I can respect that um, to, to, you know, give you a similar, similar path. 18, graduated from my 21st high school at a turn of high school. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, we had uh, FTMs or meetings planning towards me leaving independent living. Mm -hmm. um, but they had me fill out a housing voucher and the housing voucher was for like section eight or what have you, uh, which in my state, they have exceptions for foster youth. Okay. But even then, so the housing list was two years long. So mm -hmm. that wasn't going to do me no good. Mm -hmm. um, only place I, I know I had been diagnosed with ADHD and so many other things that really ruled out when I went back and got reevaluated to trauma, you know, um, and, and not working on that. So I took the diagnosis knowing that I'm not diagnosed this anymore to an apartment that lets you stay there for 18 months with this diagnosis, <laughs> you know? So I was like, okay, I'm going to play, play to my tricks or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, did that, stayed there. And I went to college because that's what everyone said. You go to college, you get money. I really went for the refund. I am not going to hold you. <laughs> Shout went, out to the refund checks. I went for the <laughs> refund. Uh, I, mean, because I, I needed money. Right? You know, 
But what hit me so hard, I was so institutionalized. I remember pacing back and forth, like, my first time, like, being in my own place, like, and I don't know if I was looking for someone to tell me direction or give me a direction to do something, but I was so institutionalized, it was bad. Mm. And then when I got to um, college, um, for me, um, I've been in public schools, I have experience in that, but majority of my academic um, years were Mm. spent in residential education mm. and if no one really knows about residential education i spoke about it on this podcast before but it's very much special education teaching if not online for most of them, at least in my state that's how it is okay. um so there's no real college readiness to residential um schooling you know so when i got to college it was a lot. It was very overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And for me and my brain, um, I was like, all these kids that got parents raising their hands, they got help when they go home <laughs> and some of this other stuff, you know, and they, you know, all the thoughts about people being smarter, all this stuff, because I just yep. was not ready and I did not have the support. Eventually yep. I dropped out. You know, and went this to is high school, right? Yep. And went okay. and, 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 and well, no, this is college. This and is college. I'm sorry. Yeah. Went to work. Um, it took me 21 different high schools to graduate um, from high school, and I eventually graduated wow. from an alternative school, similar to that timeline with you. Um, mm-hmm. I had got put into an independent living program. I was down the street from. It was the same company down the street from my residential, and I started going to the residential school. <laughs> um, But then they started to treat me different since I wasn't in the residential anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, eventually ended up leaving that residential school to go to an alternative school. Um, By that time, I had to make up most of my college, most of my high school credits within a year because stuff wasn't just transferring. And I tested out of a lot of my classes. And then I had to spend like a half, a year and a half. um, And then I graduated. Wow, well, big ups to you, man, for for you know being able to endure mm-hmm. you know, that that trial <laughs> that trial time. I um, mean, and and being able to come out with that high school diploma. That's twenty one high schools is that's a lot. I thought I went to six. I went to six high schools, and I thought that was like you know way too many. Mm-hmm. Um, so big ups to you, man. Yeah, yeah, and and I share I shared that because. You know, um, I see it as a trend, you know, uh, with people with experience, you know, going to different high schools yeah. um, or going to residential and then credits not transferring and then told you got to go back to ninth grade when you was just in 12, you know? <laughs> well, forgive me if I'm wrong, man, uh, but uh, when you transfer school statistics show that when you transfer one school district to the next, you lose six months of the education. Mm-hmm. that's i can't even do the math with 21 man that's 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 nuts to give you an estimation of my mentality my senior 11th 10th because it's all was combined in one really mm-hmm. i was learning my multiplication at 18 okay and i was already working towards graduating wow so um it was rough, you know. Um, I eventually had to, within myself, realize that I needed school, at least to get my diploma. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it took a little bit longer for me to realize I needed college for me. College is not for everybody, mm-hmm. but for me to come back to like, okay, if I want to be more in my work life other than jobs and going towards a career, I needed to go back. Mm-hmm. Um, I had did a community college and then went to a, a university and then dropped out because um, bills need to get paid. Yeah. You know, and I couldn't find that work-life balance. Mm-hmm. School was causing me so much stress or what have you. But that's my little tangent, you know. And I say that to, you you know, kind of just come back together, you know. Um, 
I, 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 I hear that. Want to touch on, I kind of want to touch mm. on the fact that you were diagnosed. Um, you know, how old were you when you were diagnosed with ADHD? I was diagnosed with ADHD in middle school. Okay. And the reason I was diagnosed with ADHD, let me give you the lay layout first, because okay. you, you can't you can't you can't miss the layout. I was fighting in school mm -hmm. um because I had had enough. You know, at that point, I was being sexually abused by uh, my female cousin and a church uh, friend that was a male. I was being severely bullied at home, sometimes to the point for my siblings where they had beat me up out of a black eye and I couldn't show up to school because they had called the people. Mm -hmm. um, I was being abused by my mom and dad uh, and um, all that. And I say all that because eventually what happened is, you know, when you experience your body experience so much pain, sometimes you faint, mm -hmm. you know, for me, I kind of had like an outer body experience. I numbed out mm -hmm. at some point from all the hurt, the pain and the words, physical and verbal and stuff like that. Excuse me. And I start to op operate out of that outer body experience. So when people finally, when, when I would go to school and stuff like that, people who would do their usually bull bullying thing, I started to realize I'm not as small as I used to be. Started to fight back. And when I would fight back, for me, I went to a place where my mom and my dad um, would do things to me. So I'm like, I'm fighting for my life. And that person had nothing to do with it. So that's where I went when I would fight people in school. And um I wouldn't stop and it became very dangerous, you know? Um, so I had, they told me I had to do anger management. They did that, put me into therapy um, and therapy was good. I started to take um, what was called Caserta and Respidol. Um, okay, I'm familiar with Respidol. Um, you know, uh, which one is a mood stimulant and one is one other. I, I don't, I used to remember this, y'all, but I don't remember now. Oh, um, what one day or whatever. But um, I took the uh, uh, huge dosage and um, then I did therapy. I had to see a therapist and what have you. And the school made just like a stipulation in order for me to, you know, uh, continue going to school and everything. Um, meanwhile, um, therapy eventually, my therapist said he's moving to Canada, was going to refer me. I know that I referred. So that was my bout with therapy that stopped. I never really did therapy after that. Mm -hmm. Um, when I went into placement, I tried to explain to them like, hey, um, I don't. Like, I don't feel like I need medication. I, I just like, this is what I was going through. And this is why I reacted. Um, but in placement, they're so focused about um, maintaining be behaviors um, and keeping you dulled down that they medicated me more. My dosage went up uh, without actual physical behaviors. I never had any restraints or physical altercations in placement. Mm. Um, when most of my physical behavior was outside of placement because I felt unsafe. When mm -hmm. I got into placement, it was, I adapted. I was good. Like this felt like home more safer mm -hmm. than being out on the street, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so from there I was on medicine until I aged out. And I even, I tried to fight back. I was like, you know, I'm not taking this medicine. I don't need it. And I would show them like, I didn't need it. I would go through spots where I would refuse and DNA would tell my judge, my judge said, I will lock you up huh. if you don't take your medicine. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm like, I'm, I'm, look, I got an A. I ain't, I ain't over here doing, they ain't had to restrain me. Mm -hmm. But if I don't take my medicine, you gonna lock me up? Yeah. What, like, so that just, I can go on and on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you about that because um, I didn't mention that, you know, uh, myself and my little brother were both um, put on um, and diagnosed with ADHD and put on um, Ritalin. Um, he was put on a 
uh, you know, a n- numerous amount of mm-hmm. um, medications. And it was when I turned 14, when I went to go live with my biological um, aunt. I think after we moved in, I was taking medication. I just told them straight up, like, I'm not taking this anymore. You know, I'm always sleepy. Um, I'm really not eating anything. You know, I just don't want to be on it. So I had, you know, the, the, the privilege to speak my mind and, you know, be taken off of my little brother remained on it. Um, and a, I really wanted to, you know, ask you, you know, what was going on um, and why you were diagnosed and why you were taking the medication and what happened, because that played a huge role later on in my life <clears throat> and why I wanted to continue my education. Um, so I think I believe I stopped at community college mm-hmm. um, with the explanation earlier, but I ended up going, um, you know, all the way to um, grad school to, and my, my plans were, I'm going to go to grad school. I'm going to get this uh, master's of social work and I'm going to get my license to practice therapy. And I'm going to study human behaviors and figure out what was going on in my brother's head. And you know what I mean? Like, why was he doing the things he was doing? And mm-hmm. it wasn't until I got in that program where I understood that um, no amount of education is going to, to, help me understand that my brother is different than who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to know why he did things differently than what I, and then how I did. Cause I was really bringing him up, helping raise him. So why wasn't he acting the way I was acting or why wasn't he doing the things I was doing? You know? So I just wanted to ask that. Yeah. Um, and that brings an interesting point. Um, and I'm trying to say this in a right way, we're just so a lot of people in in the realm of child welfare, and I'm speaking specifically about like with the whole medication thing and stuff like that. Uh, symptoms of ADHD sim- are very similar to PTSD and institutionalization, are very similar. And I truly do believe because undealt with trauma or the resources or people really taking the time to dig through the roots of a person's behavior and really seeing the behavior as language mm-hmm. a lot of people are diagnosed and put on medication when that that's really a band-aid really yeah. because say say for instance somebody that really don't need the medication but they put on the medication and it dulls them down mm-hmm. what happens when they're still dependent on that medication as an adult mm-hmm. um, but they have not still dealt with the work that they need to deal with um, and then switch insurance so they can no longer pay for the, you know, medication. And now they offer the medication. Now all that stuff floods back into their life. Yeah. You know, um, so I, I just like, I'm a big, I'm a big person on that, you know, and just really putting that out there, like do the, do the work, like, you know, please do the work, you know, if there's any agencies or organizations, you know, placements, group homes, listening, you know, just take the time, you know. Um, I know it can be overwhelming, you know, staff situations, this, that, and the third, but, you know, it's a human life at stake, you know, um, and um, I was talking to somebody else just bringing the humanity back to human service, you know, mm-hmm. really, you know, taking a look at that and really doing that. But also, um, before I go back into the the depths, you also spoke about, um you spoke about your brother and, you know, the difference in experience. And um, I once heard someone say, like, you can be in the same car, you know, and y'all, everybody experiences a car accident, but y'all not going to have the same wounds. Y'all right. not going to have the same memory of it. You know, if you sit in this seat, you sit in that seat, you're going to have a different thing. And that's really how trauma and how people's experience too on um, the child welfare system work, you know, yep. uh, Unfortunately, you know, um, there's very few people who can really say like, I, yeah, me and me and the other person I went through, we just wanted the same, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's really mysterious. Um, and that, because I think about people I was in the unit with, uh-huh. same opportunities, same trauma that wasn't care, 
I'm one, and I think about one Pacific unit that I was in. I'm one of six people who are out here um, thriving in my own right, I would say. Uh. You know, everyone else is either incarcerated, unfortunately dead, hooked on drugs, yeah. you know, or worse. Yeah. And that has be, been a trend with, I can say that it, I can go through that same thing throughout different units I experience in placement. Mm-hmm. so yeah but going back because I, I want to make sure I capture the essence of your your story and your expertise you know um going back you, you spoke about going to grad school um and thus forth so um let's talk about now you're in that adulthood yeah. you are working your way to the journey of your expertise but I'm pretty sure there were still barriers and obstacles especially as you spoke about with family, you know, with your younger brother and figuring out life. Yeah, man. Um, If I could just briefly go um, and just run you through the story of how I got from, how I went from um, community college to grad school, Um, Mm -hmm. because that was, that was the journey in itself. So briefly, I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. (laughs) Uh, community college was a struggle for me. Um, I was not what is considered an ideal student. Um, if it was not for the job, so I was working at a sneaker store in Taco Bell. Um, got fired from Taco Bell, um, remained at the sneaker store, went to like Burger King, quit Burger King. Then um, I was working at like Aldi. I was making the most money I had ever made. <laughs> you know um while going to community college while doing horrible horribly in community college um I then went to like an expo where I um came across a job as really like a resource liaison for foster youth and people in group homes um and that job if it was not for my boss who is now my you know godmother I referred to her as if it was not for her she was like the director of the program she made sure I came to I came to work after school I did my work and then got into you know what it was I did as an employee for her she wanted to make sure I finished you know what I had started at community college it took me three years I had to start at remedial courses and all um because like you like out six six schools like I didn't retain anything Mm -hmm. um which was ironic because I used to love school man I was in fifth grade dreaming about going to Yale playing soccer for Yale after I mean and life just took its turn but anyway I after I graduated from community college they put me on a, a local college tour state school college tour I went to three schools Um, And the first one we went to, they accepted all of us, former foster youth, current foster youth, whatever, like, if you apply today, you will be accepted. And it was a state school. And um, I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to a four year college. I had a horrible time in college, um, trying to figure out who I was. It wasn't that I had a horrible time on campus, but it was a transition period for me, man. It was very hard. Um, what kept me afloat, um, was that I was able to find a group of young men who were, you know, similar, um, who wanted similar things out of life to grow and, um, you know, elevate from where they came from. So I, 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 you know, I pledged a black Greek letter organization. I'm a noob. And like that stays what I've learned throughout my pledge process and like, you know, just the journey throughout college as a Kappa man, like I am, I mean, that sticks with me today. Um, I then went to go work for the Department of Human Services um, as a educational liaison for the county. And I was the first former foster youth to ever hold that position. And I'm so proud of that because I needed a master's degree to hold that position. Um, but the consistency, um, you know, within my, you know, my internships and like the experience that I was getting and the growth that they were seeing, they allowed me to hold that position. And now 
all former foster youth held hold those positions. So like, I'm super proud of that. I'm super happy that, you know, that is a thing because that's who we're working with anyway. So I think it takes an expert to, to help build, you know, um, you know, that expertise in, in a person as well. I was working alongside of a lot of MSWs and I wanted to make more money, man. I wanted to make more money. I wanted to do, you know, um, a different job that was, you know, you know, more exciting than what I was doing. I was essentially doing casework, um, working alongside of like caseworkers, guardian ad litems and such. And so I was like, you know, I need to go to grad school. School was not my thing, not at all, but I knew I needed to do it um, to get to where I wanted to be. I applied to Pitt. I'm still living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at this time. I applied to Pitt. I did not get in. They told me I needed at least four years of work experience um, or a higher GPA. So what I did was I did some research on, you know, what I needed to do to get into a graduate program. Um, and, you know, shortly after I joined the military, I enlisted with a degree I enlisted <laughs> into the Air Force. Moved out to South Dakota, Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, <laughs> and it was just like a period of isolation for me, which I needed. I did not know I needed that. Um, and I was able to, you know, come to terms with who I was as a person. I had nothing but time, nothing but time. Um, I learned a lot about myself. Shoot, I, I even picked up clippers and started cutting hair and learned how to cut hair. Now that's like my sole side hustle, you know? Um, and yeah, man, deployed overseas. And I really spent a lot of time trying to figure out what it was I wanted to do with my education uh, journey. I applied to five schools. I got into all of them because I, while in the military, I got another associate's degree. Uh, in hospitality management, which showed schools that I was willing to learn, I was willing to excel. I had the, you know, um, the ability to to do work at a college level and you know come out with you know good results. So the school I chose for gra my graduate program was Howard University. Um, best decision I had made in my twenties, I would say, my late twenties. And, you know, now I have a MSW from such a prestigious school and program. Um, and, you know, I am where I'm at now because of it. Awesome. Awesome. You've had such a journey. And I'm, I'm going to say the transition period of your life, um, the, the, the period of being aware and then grasping understanding Mm -hmm. to get into a place of maybe some forgiveness that needed to happen, you know, mm -hmm. in order it went with self, you know, or, or with other people in order to get to the place of thriving that you're in. Um, and then it's, it's really awesome to hear that. Um, you and I know, you know, it, it isn't, it isn't too often. And I'm even say this, it isn't too often we see successes with black, black uh men come yeah. out of the system yeah um and that and that's something that you know i applaud you on your resiliency and your perseverance you know um being a uh retired I, i'm a retired fighter <laughs> <My son. laughs> you know <laughs> um but you know um that doesn't mean that you stop fighting but much like yourself you took you took those and made it professional you know <laughs> absolutely i'm still fighting for some definitely you know? absolutely and um navigating from experience to expertise mm -hmm. you do a lot now in a in, in an aspect of child welfare foster care um at one of the highest levels and i know you know i was gonna mention it <laughs> i know you know uh, but um you um have done a lot so far so i really want to make sure i highlight something you said um before we get into this mm -hmm. but also give you an opportunity to share to whatever depth you want to mm -hmm. about your expertise and your work you do 
currently and present? And what is your vision for yourself or going forward? Uh, you mentioned kinship. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about the lack of resources. And also, I've heard you speak a couple times in the aspect of this kinship and lack of resources. Um, also talked about not um, labeling things as neglect when it's truly lack of uh, equity mm -hmm. um, and because of poverty, you know, really being that resource to help and uplift because I can, I can, I can say one thing that is more so of a cultural thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but um, in other words, in the child welfare aspect, you know, um, not having that equity. Um, what are your thoughts, you know, and what are some things that, you know, you think could be that difference for us in this area of having, being a resource and empowering families of birth to be able to support, you know, um, youth who come into care. So, all right, just to unpack that, I will start with the latter. So I am a huge advocate for bringing resources into the home. Um, although my personal journey, um, you know, it, it may not have helped, uh, may not have had that option. My biological mother may not have had the option, but instead of taking a child away from their family because of lack, let's say lack of nutrition mm -hmm. um, or housing, how about stepping in to provide that um, and also stepping in to provide resources for the parent? Um, yeah, uh, there was... Like just for instance, my grandmother, black grandmother, you know, black woman, she had raised her six children, um, single, um, living on her own, um, you know, in a two bedroom duplex. She had the space and the love and the, you know, the finances to care for us. Um, she just didn't have enough space um, when it came to whatever regulations the, the, the city had um, or the system had for her, for foster parents. If they could have just done something so small as to find her a three bedroom duplex or apartment or home, that could have saved us a lot of trauma. Mm. That could have saved me years of trauma and questioning um, to be with somebody that I actually trusted somebody that I actually wanted to be with, who was in the school district that I wanted to be in. Um, I was around, surrounded by my, my loved ones who I had questions about my entire life. Then, you know, I was just stripped. We were stripped from that. So I think just bringing resources into the home instead of the first option being to um, take the children away is a huge first step. You know. Thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, what what um? Well, let me backtrack here. Mm -hmm. Got my questions written down. <laughs> <laughs> um, what does? Let me let me back. So from that, what does some of the work that you're doing now? look like um and things that you're passionate about and fighting for so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um <laughs> so i work as uh the director of the congressional caucus on foster youth um on capitol hill um out of representative karen bass's office uh, she is a california representative um so the work that i do is to create like a, an open forum for Congress members and former and current foster youth um, to, you know, speak, uh, come to an agreement, um, somehow open up the floor for um, these youth delegates from all over the nation, whom I worked directly with NFYI um, with uh, 
to propose legislation that works for them. They're the experts. They know what is going on. They know what have helped them during their journey. Um, and all they want to do is to suggest, you know, in writing, what could help the next generation coming up. That, is, you know, can consist of education, resources, housing, um, uh, family, um, anything that falls under the umbrella of child welfare. Um, I am there to conduct those um, meetings, if you would, or um, uh, agreements and such. And such. Um, so yeah, that's my job really in a nutshell. I love it. It is very, it's exhilarating, honestly. Um, this is my first time outside of my short-lived internship uh, through CCAI um, uh, a few summers ago. It's my first time working on a Hill. So I get a chance to, you know, be around Congress members, change makers in that sense, but also be around uh, former foster youth who are also change makers um, who are advocating for a difference in the system. Um, and they know what they know what they're asking for. They know what expectations are of other youth as well. And I just feel honored to be able to work really for them. Um, and how that has shaped my future, um, you know, um, ambitions. I actually am very interested in um, I don't think I'm no I'm I'm any I'm no longer interested in direct practice because um, I got a chance to work under a licensed clinical therapist for six months and it was great but um, I just feel like I want to be you know where all the work begins um, in the community um, I am very interested in creating my own consulting. Um, you know, organization, company um, to, uh, you know, combat some of the things that I have seen within the child welfare system. Um, and yeah, I just really would, I just really love uh, being like a government liaison, if you would. So yeah, that's where my aspirations lie at the moment. Awesome. Awesome. I only have a few more questions for you. Okay. You know, and lastly, you know, within this work and having done macro and micro, yeah. you know, um, social work, um, in a sense, you know, um, advocating, you know, doing internships of advocacy, um, being in the depths of policy making and bills and what have you, mm -hmm. um, mental health. Mm -hmm. Now I like to think you got a grasp of it. Absolutely. How has that transitioned from that to 14 to 15 to 18 to you know so forth to now yeah you know what does mental health and self-care means to you in this role um and in the atmosphere that you work in as well mm -hmm. so without even realizing I took advantage of some resources when I um you know initially enlisted into the Air Force. As soon as I got to my base, I experienced like a lot of loneliness and um, like I said, isolation. So I said, hey, therapy is free here. I'm going to go see a therapist. I didn't know that I was going to see a therapist just to have somebody to talk to about being alone in South Dakota as a Black man. I ended up unpacking everything. <laughs> from you know questions that I had about my birth mother my 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 biological father as well um who I was as a person uh, my friends and my relationships with them um and it created this journey for me um that I will never let go of uh, my self-care journey um and then going to Howard University enhanced it um you know I have always been happy to be who I was, but now I was like proud to be a black man. Um, and um, that comes with a lot of trauma, <laughs> as you know. Um, so, you know, making sure that I'm taking care of myself, 
mentally, seeing a therapist periodically, um, and just being um, very vocal about, you know, what it is that I want, what it is that I need, and not stopping until I get that. Um, I have a whole, you know, I don't know, um, uh, regimen for myself, like a weekly regimen, you know, Mm -hmm. when it comes all the way down to, um, um, skincare, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, financial stability as well is, 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 um, you know, in that. So, um, I just, yeah, mental health care is so important. It's probably the most important thing in my life right now. Um, imposter syndrome had taken over for a while in my life. And I, I just had to realize, you know, what I've been through, um, how far I have come and get back on track. You know, it's, it's, it's a forever journey for me. You know, my mental health journey is forever. Um, and it will, you know, I think it's just healthy um, to treat your mental health journey as you would a physical fitness journey. Um, you know, so yeah. Definitely. Um, I just want to say it's been a privilege. It has been a privilege just to be able to hear your lived experience and um, to hear all the wonderful things. And even though we didn't get to go into the depths of every single thing, Mm -hmm. you know, um, hearing the journey, you know, my last few questions are more so statements for you to give uh, myself and the audience. Um, what um, piece of advice would you like to offer? Um, you can make it as general as possible mm-hmm. or to any specific group or people or what have you. Yeah, um, I had to have a lot, a lot of patience for myself um, and give myself grace um, because I did not start, you know, on a, a fair or equal uh, playing field. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it was a lot of literally pulling myself up. Mm-hmm. Um, so patience, I feel like patience is a virtue that, you know, leads to a payoff. Um, and if you're patient with yourself, um, you know, it brings so much joy and uh, understanding to your life. And just depending on, I'm a very independent person, so I really don't like to depend on others, but depending on that level of comfortability um, that you have with others, um, it's okay to lean on the people that are in your life. Um, I had to learn that the hard way, uh, but utilizing those people in your life because they're there for a reason, you know, if you're going to be there for them, there's, you know, no, no doubt. in there should be no doubt in your mind that they'll be there for you as well. Um, and just building that community is very, very important for people like us. Um, regardless of who your community is, build that community and, um, you know, hold tight to that. Um, yeah, so I guess that, that would be it. Oh, yeah. Education saved my life, man. I say that all the time, education saved my life and not it might not be the route that everyone can or wants to take. But if you're willing to take that chance, I never thought after what I say, sixth grade, fifth grade, I never thought college or any post-secondary education was going to be the route for me. It just kind of fell in my lap and I just put effort towards it. If you are one that is willing to put that effort towards anything, it can save your life. You know? So, yeah. Definitely, definitely. And last, any last comments? Now, this space is, if you got a song, an album, a rap, <laughs> whatever you trying to drop on the plug right now, you know, um, how can people stay connected to you? How can people, you know, reach out, you know, um, whatever you got going on, drop it, you know, feel free. Yeah. Um, 
okay, I do, <laughs> I do cut hair on the side. So the fade clinic with a K is like my Instagram handle. Um, it's just like a fun hobby for me. Um, I've gotten pretty good at it. And um, yeah, it might be something that I want to pursue in the future uh, professionally. Um, uh, you know, that's an option for me. And then look forward to my podcast, um, Fool's Discretion or um, Fool's Disclosure. I haven't chosen the name just yet, but um, it'll just be diving into, you know, my lifestyle and um, what I do day to day. And then also having co-hosts who um, have different experiences than I do and who have had different experiences than I have had growing up. Um, you know, it's a podcast about everything, um, uh, you know. So, yeah, I'm excited about that. Awesome. Awesome. It's truly been a privilege and an honor. I can't, I like for me, like I love, don't get me wrong audience. I love interviewing everyone <laughs> I've had on here, but you don't know what joy it is to see another black male making it in its own right. Wow. Like I have seen so few representations you know, of us. Yeah. It's almost a rarity for me to see it and, and to have, and you ain't got to even be perfect, you know, because neither, neither one of us are, you know, but we out here, you know, thriving in our own lives. And that's something that I admire and I appreciate. And it's an honor to be able to have you on and to hear your story and to see you just doing you and living your life unapologetically, yeah. you know? Um, so that's truly um a privilege to be able to see that and see you walk in that um this platform is here if you want to come back when you do your consulting thing when you got your podcast and you want to drop another plug this podcast is here for you whenever you would like to continue to share a little bit more about your journey as you continue to flourish all right michael i really appreciate you uh it's been an honor to be on here um so yeah i will for sure be back so whenever you want to have me i'm back on man definitely thank you guys for listening it has been an honor and a privilege to be able to have cortez on um y'all already know my spiel that i give COVID still out there it's getting ready to be flu season take care of yourself if you need to wear a mask wear a mask just be healthy it takes all of us we all are part of this big old village so be mindful of your neighbors you know Truly be mindful of your neighbors. Other thing is we unpacked a lot of things that can be triggering, you know, bring up some stuff. Be aware of your mental health. You know, um, if you listen to this episode and you feel triggered, you know, after, you know, you done or take a break in the middle of listening to it, you know, or what have you, um, take some time to debrief. Do some mindfulness exercises. I do not want to enable, you know, unsafe mental health habits. So if you are triggered, please take a break, you know, from this episode. Um, bring yourself back together, whichever that looks like for you. Also, if you have not taken care of your mental health, we out here breaking stigmas, you know, changing labels, you know, walking away from all these un, um, unhealthy narratives. And I applaud everybody that's listened to this. If you have not, you know, um, done anything towards your mental health, now is the time. Holiday season's coming up. It affects us all in many different ways. So please make sure that you find yourself a therapist, an advisor, a friend, a goldfish, whoever works with you in your mental health. Get you a nice little regimen, whether that's getting your nails done, you know, putting a face mask on, you know, whatever, do it, what makes you happy, but please take the time to make sure that you're taking care of your mental health. If I can give you guys anything, um, please do that. This has been a privilege and an honor. Um, I said I was going to look and see what episode this was. I'm going to say, <laughs> um, I did not look, but I am about to find out for y'all real quick. Um, Give me one second. I, I'm about. To, I got y'all. I got y'all. It's episode eleven. All right, <laughs> episode eleven. Um. So, um, you guys know 
after this season is done. I hope to try to get to 52. Maybe I may I maybe be able to get to that, maybe not, to just top season one. But after this season, I'm going to be taking a little break. I released two seasons in one year. And there's a, there's a lot in these seasons. So I want you to take the time to really get the information out of them and reflect um, and really, you know, um, do the work that comes with these episodes, you know, because most of these, you know, I'm interviewing people to help you guys start on that path too, if that's something that you need to do, you know, um, but yeah, I'm going to be taking a break, you know, um, and that break isn't, you know, cause I like to work. It ain't going to be all kind of break or what have you, but I'm going to be trying to take the resilient voices and beyond and um, kind of launch that as an initiative in communities, you know, to combat the narratives that we see between human service um, agencies and those um, black and brown communities and kind of trying to do my, do my help, do my way of working and trying to combat that, but also working with lived experience people. Um, so more than likely season three will be back within, um, that fall <laughs> if if the end i ain't gonna you know it's still up in the air but that's it um thank you guys for listening this has been resilient voices and beyond you guys have a good night good morning good whenever you listening to it just let it be good um talk to you guys so